In this video lecture, we are going to use the power of vectors to solve geometrical problems in three dimensions. We will look into the equations for lines and planes and the calculation of distances. Let's start with lines. This equation here is the parametric equation of a line. Vector r, which is a function of a parameter lambda, equals vector r0 plus lambda times vector v. This equation describes the line marked here as a dashed line. Here we see the vector r0 and the vector v, which is copied here. r0 is a vector which joins the origin to any point on the line, while v is just a vector which indicates the direction of the line. r is the position vector which points from the origin to any point in the line. Lambda is our parameter. It's a real number that can take any value. You can think of a parameter as a slider, as we have here. We can slide the value of lambda to any real value that we want, and this will modify the position vector r. For example, when lambda equals 0, then r equals r0 as we see here. When lambda equals 1, then r equals r0 plus v, as we see here. If lambda is 0 0.5, then we do r0 plus halfway through v. If lambda is minus 1, then we get r0 minus v. And in general, any value of lambda, any value of this parameter, gives us a different point along the line. The line is infinite and so are the possible values of lambda. In summary, given a point r0 and a vector v, we can write down the equation for this line as r as a function of lambda equals r0 plus lambda v. There are other equivalent ways of writing the equation of a line. For example, what if we are given two points? given by vectors a and b. How can we write the equation of the line which crosses both points? That's relatively easy. What we can do is we can take r0 to be any of the two points, for example a, so we call this now r0, and then we can take v to be any vector in the line, so we can use this vector here, which is b minus a. Substituting these two into the equation of a line, we get r of lambda is equal to a plus lambda b minus a. Notice that we can rewrite this in the following way. And if we rename our parameters, for example, alpha and beta, then as long as alpha plus beta equals 1, we can write the equation of a line as r equals alpha a plus beta b. This equation is particularly pleasant because it puts vectors a and b on equal grounds. And basically we have a linear combination of them with a certain restriction in the coefficients. We are starting to see that there are many ways of writing the equation of a line, and we will see even more. So let's start doing a summarizing table. This is our summary table, and we will end up filling up all the cells. So far we have looked at the equation of a line, and we have looked at the parametric equation, given by this equation here. We have also seen how to write the equation of a line if we are given two points, a, and b. And we have seen two ways of doing this. One was by identifying a value for r0 and a value for v in terms of a and b, and the other way was rearranging and renaming the parameters to have a very symmetrical form with alpha a plus beta b, with a certain condition on alpha and beta. Now we are going to continue filling up this table by looking at other ways of writing the equation of a line. The first one is by using the cross product. For example, given a line, notice that the vector joining r0 with any point in the line r, which is given by r minus r0, this vector will always be parallel to vector v. Therefore, the cross product of both must be 0, so we can write the equation of a line as r minus r0, which is this vector here cross v equals 0, which we can now add to our table. Something should be said about this equation. 
previous equations for the line gave us a recipe for creating the line. Feeding the parameter values from minus infinity to infinity into the previous equations, we could obtain the locations of the infinite points along the line. This new equation using the cross product, however, cannot do this. There is no parameter. The equation is just a condition that any point r on the line must fulfill. The equation does not give us the position vectors for the line, but Given a position vector, we can tell whether it is on the line or not by checking if it fulfills this condition. Also notice that the left-hand side is a vector product, and therefore it has three components, because it is a vector. The three components must be equal to zero. Therefore, this simple equation really involves three different equalities. Next, we can write the equations without using vector notation and instead using the components. In this case, vector r is given by x, y, z. Vector r0 is given by x0, y0, z0. And vector v is given by vx, vy, vz. In this way, our usual parametric equation for the line can be written as follows. Which can be written as three separate equations. If we now solve these three equations in terms of lambda, we can arrive at the following. And since lambda is our parameter, lambda can be any value which the three terms must be equal to. So we can do without it and simply write the equation of a line as simple equalities between different terms. We can now add this form of the equations into our table. Like the previous equation, this one is really a condition rather than a recipe to obtain position vectors. Now that we have all these equations for the line, it would be good for you to pause this lecture and go through all these different uh, equations for a line, shuffling from one to another. For example, make up some arbitrary point R0 and some arbitrary vector V, and find the equations of the line in all these different forms. Or come out with two arbitrary points, A and B, and write down the equation for the line crossing the two points in all these different ways. You might also ask yourself, how are all these equations related to the usual equation for a line that you have all studied, y equals mx plus c? The relation is actually pretty straightforward. If we come back to the components equation, we can get the first two terms, the first equality, since the third one is not used when we're in two dimensions. We solve for y. and then we easily identify the term m and the term c. Note that when we are writing the equation of a line in terms of its components, we have a certain weakness. There are some weak spots. For example, what happens if we want a line in which vx, the x component of the vector v, is zero? This would be such a line. And then you notice that if we want to write it in terms of y equals mx plus c, then m would have to be infinite, and c, there is no intercept, so it doesn't really work. However, the vector notations, like the parametric equation, always works. Let's now move on to the equations of planes. We will start with the parametric equation of a plane, which has a similar form to the one for a line. Let's have a look at how this looks geometrically. In this 3D representation, we can see a plane, Although the plane would be infinite, here I'm showing only a finite section of the plane. And we are seeing the parametric equation of the plane. Vector r, which is any position on the plane, is equal to r0 plus lambda u plus mu v. r0 is a vector which points to any point in the plane. And it determines where the plane is located. u and v are two vectors that are contained in the plane. So together they define the direction of this plane. While lambda and mu are our new parameters. Again, our parameters can be imagined as sliders. Right now they are set to zero, and therefore r is simply equal to r zero. If we move the parameter lambda, then we see that we are going to add multiples of vector u to our r zero. And that's exactly what's happening now. So that changing our parameter lambda moves our position vector r along the direction of u. 
Similarly, changing our parameter mu will add multiples of vector v. So indeed, sliding our value of mu moves our position vector r in the direction of v. Notice that together, lambda and mu are enough to cover any point in the plane. Also notice that vectors u and v can be any two vectors in the plane. They don't have to be orthogonal to each other. For example, we can skew them and we can still cover the whole plane by varying lambda and mu, simply that we don't have this nice rectangular grid. As you can see, the concepts are pretty much identical to those of a line. But while the line was one-dimensional, having a single parameter to move along it, the plane is a two-dimensional surface, and therefore it has two parameters, lambda and mu, required to move along it. Let's imagine our parametric equations as two functions, which we can draw as boxes, called line and plane. The line has a scalar input lambda, and outputs a position vector that represents the line. This line function maps the one-dimensional real number line to all the three-dimensional positions along the line. Each specific value of lambda is mapped to a fixed position along the line. Our function for the plane has two scalar inputs, which we could also see as a two-dimensional vector input, and it outputs a position vector on the plane. It maps each point in the whole plane of parameters lambda and mu into each point of the plane in three-dimensional space. Note that if we wiggle around the value of lambda across the real line, this will in turn wiggle around the position vector along the line. And similarly, if we move the values of lambda and mu wiggling around the plane, we will in turn wiggle around the three-dimensional plane. The number of independent parameters that we can vary freely is also referred to as degrees of freedom. The degrees of freedom of a geometrical entity define the number of dimensions that it has. For example, a point has no degrees of freedom and therefore is a zero-dimensional entity. Lines have one degree of freedom and are one-dimensional, while planes have two degrees of freedom and thus are two-dimensional. We can even write volumes using three degrees of freedom and they are three-dimensional. Having looked at the parametric equation of a plane, we can now ask ourselves how to write the equation of a plane if we are given three points A, B and C. So let's think about it. We are given three points A, B, C and we know that the three points must define a certain plane. Now, in order to write this in a parametric form, we need, as usual, any point in the plane, which will be R0, so for example we can choose A, and then we need two vectors that are contained in the plane. We can choose, for example, U equals B minus A, and V equals C minus A. This is a valid choice. So now we can write our parametric equation for a plane and substitute the values that we have chosen. R0 equals A, U equals B minus A, and V equals C minus A. Doing this substitution, we arrive at the following equation. Next, we can do something similar to what we did with lines. We can do some algebra and rewrite the names of the parameters so that we can end up writing the following. R equals alpha A plus beta B plus gamma C with the condition that alpha plus beta plus gamma equals 1. You can prove this as a very simple exercise. This notation is nice because it puts the vectors a, b, and c into equal grounds. So let's add these two equations into our table. Now let's look at an equation for planes using products. Let's consider a plane in space with a certain vector r0. And now, instead of defining two vectors u and v contained in the plane, we can define a vector that is perpendicular to the plane. This is called the normal vector to the plane. It is evident to see that any vector contained in this plane, which we can write as r minus r0, will be perpendicular to this normal vector. Therefore, their dot product will be zero. This is a very common equation for a plane. It shows that a plane can be completely defined if we are given a point and a normal vector. To obtain the component equations, we can rearrange 
r dot n equals r zero dot n, which we can now write in component form. The right hand side is all constants, so we can do the dot product and arrive at a single number d. While the left hand side can be expanded using the dot product, arriving finally to the equation of a plane in component form nx times x plus ny times y plus nz times z equals a number d. A common question when trying to change between one form of the equation of a plane to another is how to obtain the normal vector n. So that's very easy, as long as we have two vectors contained in the plane, for example the usual vectors u and v, then we can find the normal vector n as the cross product of both. Normally when we work with normal vectors we prefer to use the normalized unit normal vector and that's very easy because we can just divide n by its length. We can also have a look at what is the equation of a sphere centered at point r0. Well it is easy to see that by definition of a sphere any point r which is in the surface of this sphere, will have a distance to the point R0 equal to A, where A is the radius of the sphere. Therefore, the length of R minus R0 is equal to A. And this constitutes an equation for the sphere. Remember that the length of a vector squared can be written as the dot product of the vector with itself. Therefore, we can write the equation of a sphere as follows. We now turn our attention to the last part of this video. We are going to solve geometrical problems using vectors. In particular, we are going to show how easy it is to compute distances between points, lines and planes. For this I created another summarizing table. So let's start with the distance from a point to a line. So what's the distance between a point P and this line here? And let's say we know the position vector of a point in the line. It doesn't matter which one. Clearly the distance between the point and the line is given by this perpendicular distance here. Also we know the direction of the line with vector v. Actually it's much easier if we consider v as a unit vector. So we know v is normalized to have a length of 1. Then this vector here that joins point r line to point p, which is given by p minus r line, forms an angle theta with vector v. And then from simple trigonometry of this right angle, we can find that the distance we are interested in is simply equal to the length of the vector p minus r line multiplied by the sine of theta. And it turns out that there is a very nice way to calculate this using the cross product. So what is the cross product between this vector p minus r line and the vector v? Actually, remember that we are considering v to be a unit vector. Well, according to the definition of the cross product, the magnitude of this cross product is the magnitude of the first vector times the magnitude of the second times the sine of theta. But since the magnitude of v is 1 because it's a unit vector, then this cross product is exactly what we wanted. It's equal to d, the distance between the point and the line. Remember that for this equation to work, the point that we have labeled as r line can be any point on the line. For example, it could be r0 in the parametric equation of the line. And remember that vector v that defines the direction of the line has to be normalized. If you are given a vector v that is not normalized, you have to remember to normalize it. Next, we look at calculating the distance between a point and a plane. So here is the point and here is the plane. The distance is clearly this distance which hits the plane at perpendicular right angles to the plane. Therefore it is a distance that points in the direction of the normal vector of the plane. And that's the key, because we know that doing the dot product with a unit vector in a certain direction gives you the distance of the vector in that direction. Therefore if we can find any vector that joins the plane to the point, so p minus r plane, where r plane is any position in the plane, then we do the dot product with the normal unit vector n and we end up finding the distance that we want. Next, let's find the distance between two lines. 
This is extremely difficult to visualize in our heads, so let's use a 3D representation. Here we see two arbitrary lines defined by their parametric equations with their position vectors r1 and r2 and their directions v1 and v2. So what is the distance between these two lines? Well, let's start thinking about the distance between two arbitrary points in the lines, like these two points. If we draw this distance, we can see that the distance clearly depends on which points we choose along the line. But we are interested on the minimum distance. So just by fiddling around, we can try to guess where this minimum distance must be. But it's not easy at all. We can guess that the minimum distance must be somewhere around here. The trick is to realize that the distance becomes minimum exactly when the orientation of this distance is perpendicular to both lines at the same time. We can compute a direction perpendicular to both lines by doing the cross product between v1 and v2. We can call this result our normal vector n. And we can turn it into a unit vector n hat by doing the proper division. For more insight, this vector will in fact be the normal vector of the two planes which are parallel to each other and which include both lines, which I can show here. The minimum distance between the lines is exactly equal to the constant distance that exists between these two planes. Finding this distance is now very easy. Once we realize that we can always find two planes that are parallel which contain both lines, then it's very easy to realize that the normal vector of these planes must be given by the cross product of vectors v1 and v2 of the two lines. Then, if we define any vector joining any two points of the two lines, which we write here as r line 1 minus r line 2, then if we do the dot product of this vector dot n hat, this will give us the projection of the vector r line 1 minus r line 2 in the direction of n which is exactly the distance that we want. Remember that n must be a unit vector, so we have to do the cross product of v1 and v2 and then divide by the magnitude. Finally, we can look at the distance between a line and the plane, which is extremely similar to what we just saw. If we are given a line and a plane, well, in most cases, the line will crash into the plane somewhere and the distance will be zero. However, we can have the special case in which the line is contained in a plane that is parallel to the plane we're interested in. In this case, the distance between the line and the plane is this perpendicular distance here. To check if this is the case, we can consider the normal vector n to the plane and the vector v parallel to the line, and we can check if their dot product is zero. If it is, then the two vectors are perpendicular, and therefore the line does never intercept the plane. Once we know this, then finding the distance d is very easy. We can follow the same procedure as before. We can find any point on the line and in the plane, and then we can get this vector, which we can call r line minus r plane, and do the dot product with the unit vector n and this will give us the distance projected into the direction of n, which will be the distance between the line and the plane. So, you can appreciate how easy vector operations can solve geometric problems which would otherwise be very complex. I would like to finish the lecture with a final thought. You might be wondering, what's the use of all this? When will I need to calculate distances in three-dimensional space? As you will soon see, Vectors can be used to represent abstract things, far beyond mere directions in space. With this lecture you have learned to work with vectors representing lines and planes, but these same concepts will appear in entirely different contexts, in which vectors do not represent physical three-dimensional entities. Yet, we can still think about them as if they did, transforming abstract problems into geometrical ones. Thanks for watching.